good. Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you for taking the time to join us for another Kenya Rugby Union interactive session. Today, we discuss rugby, books, and entrepreneurship with two distinguished members of the rugby family. We have Celestine Masinde. She plays her club rugby for Stanbic Mwamba. She also plays for the Kenya Lionesses in the 7s and 15s versions of the game. She is an Olympian as well, having represented Kenya at the 2016 Olympic Games in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And we also have Jacob OJ. Jacob OJ plays his club rugby at KCB and is a regular for the Kenya 7s and 15s national teams. Well, Sele OJ, many people watch you guys on the field of play. They watch you in the video clips that are aired on TV or online. They read about you and uh, your exploits. And this evening, you have an opportunity to share a lot more insights about your journey through rugby, books, and entrepreneurship. And to set the ball rolling, we will get down to asking both Sele and OJ who they are. So, Sele, um, who is Celestine Masinde? Uh, I don't know how much time you have. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start, uh, okay. we're running out already. <laughs> so in a nutshell, um, my name is Celeste Masinde, for those who do not know me. As you've heard, I play for Stanbic Mwamba, as well as the national uh, uh, Kenyan team, uh, rugby. So basically, um, I was born in 1987. That should tell you that I've lived quite a bit and I've played quite some rugby. I'm on the third floor, probably on my way out, uh, however, um, I was, I'm, I'm the last born of uh, a family of five girls. Uh, I'm born to an amazing mom who's also my mentor. You know, she's my anchor, my support system. She's my everything. She means actually the world to me. Uh, she's made me who I am today. Um, I was raised in uh, Buruburu, back when Buruburu was Buru. And uh, I've lived there for probably a decade and a half before I went to, I moved, now moved to Kasarani which is where I'm um, currently uh, staying to date. Um, I went to school in Wanja and Kim, that's primary. Uh, I went to State House Girls High School, where I graduated and um, currently I'm doing uh, my master's. I went, I, I went to St. Paul's University. Currently I'm doing my, JQuart, uh, my master's at JQuart. So in a nutshell, that's where I am. Um, aside from my personal, um, from my academics, um, I play rugby for the national team. I've played for 15 plus years. So I'm actually an oldie and um, I'm, I'm actually a proud, a proud member of the Kenya Rugby Union as a, as a player. OJ, it's your turn yeah. to tell us who you are. It's my turn, eh? Uh, yes, my is. name is Jacob OJ. Uh, most of you just call me OJ. And um, uh, I'm, 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 I'm the fourth born in a very huge family. A family of boys. We have very few few girls in our in our bloodline. So uh, I was born to an amazing mom and uh, and a dad who's uh, very supportive. who been very supportive in my life. Um, uh, I was born in in Kisumu, but my early childhood childhood was in Nairobi. Uh, we used to live in in in, in South B, and um, <clears throat> that's where I started my schooling. But we moved to Kisumu in two thousand in the year two thousand. So uh, most of my uh, adult adult life has been in Kisumu. I went to primary in um, in Bayani Primary School, but I didn't get to do my exams there. I did my exams in a different school uh, called Gulf Academy. That's why I, I finished my my class eight. Then went on to Katnonotunga High School. Uh, that's why I did my high school. That's where I, I um, started rugby, playing rugby uh, in school and and in, in club and. Um, um, ideally, my favorite sport growing up was never rugby. I just fell in love with, with rugby after after uh, seeing my elder brother play it, uh, which is, I'll talk about when I'll be talking about my rugby journey. But uh, basically, that, that's uh, that's that's me. Yeah. All right. So we are now going into the rugby journeys. Sele OJ, who or what inspired you to get into the game? 
Uh, for me, I'll say um, who actually got me uh, to start playing rugby. That is an, a veteran uh, called, we used to call her Irene Cheria. She's one of the iconic women uh, who played rugby for a long time. She used to be our iron, uh, our iron man, so to speak. So uh, um, I used to play basketball in high school. And then after high school, I joined KCB, uh, I joined KCB women, um, women Club uh, playing basketball. So I did that for quite a bit, for probably a year or so after high school. And then that's where I met Irene Cheria. It was me and another, my best friend, whom were playing both basketball and rugby. Uh, she told us, actually, there's this sport which is just starting. You, you guys should come check it out. I think you guys can do it. Because at the time, we were excelling in basketball and we were, we were very young, actually. I think I was around just turning 17. So, okay, my friend said, okay, fine, let me just go and try it out. But then I was skeptical. I said, no, um, rugby is too, is too, for me, I felt it was too rough. So, you know, I said, no. Uh, they went, my friend told me, uh, you know what, actually, um, next week we're traveling to Uganda. And I was like, oh, wait a minute. I've been playing basketball for close to a year, and the only sport that I've, you know, the only um, game that I've been, you know, uh, selected to, to, to represent my club for is in Kisumu. So I said, you know what, let me try. So after fast forward, they went to Uganda, they were crushed, and when they came back, um, I said, you know what, ah, let me just stick to basketball. Then basketball got, got disbanded. So that was kind of my, my, my key to go and try out something new and something different. So I approached Irene and I was like, mm, so now I'm free and I've not joined campus. Instead of being idle, let me just you know, join you and see what, what happens. And you know, to cut the long story short, that, that is how I got into rugby, um, courtesy of Irene Cheria. At the time, I believe, uh, the person who inspired me the most was uh, Serevi because he was really big and uh, you know I started watching uh, him and you know just developing a liking to the sport and just that's just how it started for me. All right so what are some of your earliest rugby memories mm -hmm. that you got into the game? Yeah um, my earliest rugby memories would be uh, the first time that I went on that pitch after I was now uh, fully convinced and, you know, I told her, fine, and let me, I'm, I'm, I'll be following you, I'll carry my kids and, you know, I'll not be on the sideline. So I, that day I changed and, you know, we were at a uh, railways club, that is Mwamba RFC, where uh, my, my one and only club. So we went and I changed, so we were on the pitch and uh, at the time we were sharing the pitch with, uh, with the men. So Kinakolo are training over there, and I was like, we we're just watching them. Then our coach was Kilonzo. He was taking us through the moves. I remember at some point after like 10 minutes into it, uh, the ladies started, you know, they were running around. And I was wondering, what, okay, what's happening? So before I knew it, I looked behind, and the boys were coming towards our trial line because we just had like a box. I was hit so hard, and I never got back to the pitch until after like six months. Not that I was injured, but just because I felt like, you know what, I cannot do this. But, you know, here I am. So that was actually one of the pivotal moments of, you know, when I decided um, I would actually join rugby and I would be serious in it and, you know, just see where it can take me because I, I felt like it had so many opportunities. That is immediately after the six months when I decided to go back. Yeah, so obviously that um, when you are hit behind the posts, obviously jolted into a lot. And yeah. a few years later, you were in the national team. How mm -hmm. has it been playing for the national team all these years? Um, I remember back in the day, um, you know, and this is what I tell up and coming, uh, uh, you know, players in my, in my team. Uh, I tell them that, you see, back in the days, we, we never used to have like, quote unquote, national team. We had only one club, which was Mwamba, and, one, and, and Mwamba was the national team. It doubled up as the national team. So for me, my experiences in Mwamba was actually my experience as a national team player. Um, we've had good times, and of course, we've had really, really, uh, uh, you know, lows. Um, the, the highs were probably when you know I scored my first try. Because the only two I used to go to was maybe Uganda and back, Uganda and back. So my first tournament, which I, I got selected to, to, to play in the team, um, was in Uganda. And I believe, I remember that, that 
first tournament is when I scored my first try ever. And immediately after scoring the try, you know, there is this um, euphoria and um, what can I say? There is this, you know, you just feel like you get lured towards the sport more and more and you want, you, you want more. It's like, you, it's like a drug. So after scoring and everyone was hailing my name, wow, new player, she came in, she scored, uh, you know, the only try and things like that. I was like, hmm, I'm onto something. Probably this is something that I can pursue further because see, I was still a bit skeptical and uh, much as my family has been my biggest supporters, personally, I was not so sure. So after I scored my first try, you know, it was something that, you know, I was proud of. And when I went back home, I was like, I wanted more. Because for me, I'm all about, you know, um, determination and, and self-drive and, and focusing on one thing to see how far it can take me. That's why I'm still here, you know, 15, 16 plus years, because I still feel like there's, there's more I can, I, there's, there's far much more that I can, that I can achieve with a sport. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, we've had, uh, that is my high. Um, in terms of my rugby journey, um, you know, we've had a lot of uh, bumps on the road, like, you know, we would, would go and play and there's no allowance, uh, there's no medical cover, you know, you just go there because of passion and because, you know, you feel like this is something that can actually uh, take you far in life. Because remember, uh, we are the pioneers of, of, you know, women's rugby. And at the time, there were no women playing rugby. It was just unheard of. So, I know it's been really difficult. We'd go and not get paid allowances. I remember um, back in 2000 and I think it was six or seven when we started getting paid something. So I think uh, I remember the TM handed us, you know, 5,000. And we all looked at each other and we asked, okay, to whom am I sharing this money? Because that was, we felt like that was so much money and we were, we were pretty much shocked. Like, wow, all this money, what am I doing with it? 5,000, whom am I like? You know how many people am I going to share share it with? So basically, that that's just those are some of the you know uh, things that we had to to go through. Um, of course, you know in 20, 2015, we lost our captain uh, Abedin Shikoi. In yeah. you know after she succumbed to like a, a really big hit, she was actually the tackler. So those are some of the lows, and you know it could it goes on and on, but. 15 years has been, you know, quite a ride. Yeah, obviously you've been in the game for 15 years and now having shifted from basketball, what are some of the lessons that rugby has taught you? Mm -hmm. um, uh, rugby has taught me to be determined, um, you know, to have that self-drive, uh, you know, and to, and to really, because you see, as I've told you initially when we were starting, we were losing so much. We lost so many games that it reaches a point whereby, you know, losing is no longer an option. So what next? Um, it gave us that, um, it gave me personally that, you know, I, ha I have a fear of failure. So it gave me a, some sort of a drive to achieve more. To, and, and when I achieve more, I want even more. So as I said, it's like a drug and it's taught me discipline. It's taught me integrity. It's taught me, you know, some of the core values that we have in the sport. It's taught me teamwork and, you know, how to work with people. You see, um, there's a lot of competition. Co competition can be healthy and it can also go, go left. So, you know, I've learned so much over the years that I've applied in my life today. And that is what has made me who I am. I, you know, being the entrepreneur that I am today, being a, a hardworking, self-driven and, and career woman. All right. Um, um, as a woman playing rugby, how does that feel more so at the highest level in the land? Mm -hmm. mm. Um, okay, it has, um, I'll say for the most part, it's um, actually a, a privilege and an honor, and it's something that not many women can achieve or can brag about. Um, more so being, uh, having played, uh, you know, the high performance, played against teams uh, currently in the World Series, and you've been able to take them up and, you know, be a competition. So it gives me some sort of um, fulfillment. Um, and also, you see, at times, 
you can have resentment thinking, okay, uh, what has this court done for me in terms of, you see, monetary wise? But I always reel myself back in and I remember that it gives me purpose. It gives me um, a sense of belonging. Um, I've been, all through my life, I've been uh, a sports person. Uh, I've loved, you know, I was the kind of kid who would climb trees and things like that. It's given me a sense of a cushion, a sense of belonging to know that um, um, there are many like me and um, I'm a superwoman, really, uh, to, so to speak. Yeah. All right. Jacob Oje. Yes, Mike. Um, you two are in the national team. Uh, you initially started telling us about who inspired you to get into rugby. That's your brother, Casey. Now that you got into rugby, what were your earliest uh, memories of the game? Um, my earliest memories of the game, I actually started playing rugby at a really um, early age. Uh, my first club rugby was in 2007 uh, for Kisuma FC, and I was still in, in high school. I was still in Form 2. I remember it was um, it was an ESS game between Kisumu against Mombasa, and we had to travel um, all the way to Mombasa to play that game. I was in the I was it was during the, the long term break uh, in in high school, and I was just used to train with the, with the club when uh, whenever I had time or whenever I was in the break. So I got I got selected to go play in in, in Mombasa for that game. I didn't play much of the game. I played like 15 minutes, I think the last 15 minutes of the game. And uh, but the reason why that sticks is because um, um, it, it, it initiated me to club rugby. I never I played high school rugby before. I played touch tournaments uh, at Kisumu, but I never played uh, with the big boys. Uh, here I was starstruck a bit because now uh, the veteran that, that, that time in the, in the team that time was um, Newman. I, I think uh, the old heads would would remember him. And when we went down to, to Mombasa, the coach who was also captaining the team that side was the veteran Oscar Osir. So having been introduced to rugby at, at, at an early age and having known this person, then finally meeting him and playing against him, I think I was starstruck at the same time. And um, that, that's when I realized like, I, can, I can really play rugby right now because if I can be in the same field with these people. That team actually, uh, that team, that Mombasa team had some of my teammates right now, because people like uh, Musala, uh, Darwin, Abeka, all the Musita, all these people are in the Mombasa team. So um, it gave me confidence going forward, because now I, I, I made a team, uh, actually a side, a very, a very strong side, to, to, I got selected to, to go represent it in, in an ESS game. And I think it was either qualifiers or the semifinals. That's how my journey into uh, I'd say pro or semi pro, or oh, that that's what kick started my journey to to rugby. I say that's like one of the main boys that I, I remember that actually kick started my career. And then um, later on in high school, when I was just finishing high school in 09, um, I also got selected again to play the the Safari Sevens uh, in the school category. Um, I think that's one of the best tournaments that's, uh, that that had in the calendar, the Safari Sevens, but it also included the school category. But that school category tournament really opened up my eyes because that's when they came to Nairobi like um, and shared a stage with some of the names that we've been seeing around, like um, the Ijeda, the Kayange, or in the senior team. But now we were playing together, and when you go to the warm up and the changing level, to go and meet them up. So. That small part of my career, of my, my journey towards rugby, really boosted my confidence in, in trying to pursue rugby as a career or trying to pursue it and doing the best I could in it. Uh, and that's like um, uh, another stepping stone to my career because now I, it also showed me uh, the big stage and how people operated at the big, big stage, even though it was uh, glimpses because I just meet here people, I meet people uh, for five minutes or so meet one of my adults for three minutes and ask the same same questions that I've been asked uh, over the past few years, like um, how, what would you need to do to get this kind of a level and that kind of stuff. So meeting those people, interacting with them really played a big role. But now the, the effort of my career and, and what really made me um, push to play rugby uh, to the highest level was the team with Kisumu when we, when we, when we played and got uh, promoted to the Kenya Cup. 
I think that's when I realized now that uh, uh, I could I could do more with rugby. I could play rugby uh, to a further level because having played uh, and made the competition that we did for the two years that we played to, to get the promotion to Kenya Cup, I think everyone in that team had realized that we had more potential than that we even noticed or realized ourselves. So when we actually got promoted to Kenya Cup, it took us two years, I think two or three years, and we were just getting to the finals and uh, no team was being promoted. Again, we got to the finals, uh, no team was being promoted. But the third, third time of asking, I think both Kisumu and uh, Homeboys got promoted. And uh, the feedback from clubs in Nairobi and how you are being scouted by the clubs in Nairobi just gave us the realization that uh, we actually are good. We just play out in Nairobi, but we actually good to compete with the big boys in, in Nairobi. And uh, I think those three um, uh, um, points of my career really uh, really uh, boosted me to being the player that uh, today. Yeah, then you obviously made the move, move to KCB at some point. You've talked about your experiences in Kisumu. So how are your experiences at KCB as well? Uh, KCB was just... Um, I think it was just something that was bound to happen because if you play in Kisumu, there's very few clubs that you can really go on and play to, uh, to for again. Uh, Kisumu ideally had produced very big players for KCB as a club. So when you call the Alubaka, um, Derek Omalua, then you go to our current coach, Curtis, then Andrew Amonde, like you just knew you had a part if you're moving to Nairobi, you had a path that you're supposed to, to, to follow or to which club you're supposed to go to. But mine was special because Andrew, um, Andrew talked, to me about, uh, talked to me about this way before I even decided to come to Nairobi or to move to, to, to any club in Nairobi. It just given me an ultimatum that uh, whenever you show up in Nairobi, make sure you show up at KCB. So me moving to KCB was just something that was bound to happen. And when I got there, uh, I remember uh, when I got there, it was just after uh, my last game for Kisumu against Nakuru in the Enterprise Cup, and we, we, we knocked out Nakuru. So the next game we were playing was against, against Queens. So when I got to KCB, I couldn't play the Enterprise Cup again because I had already played for, for, um, for Kisumu. And uh, the then coach was Howard. Howard, but that's what the, the coach I got in Kisumu in, in, in KCB. And Curtis was the assistant coach. Funny thing is, when I went for training, the few training games that I had, Howard wanted to select me for the game, but I remember Curtis saying I was not ready yet. I remember I was very beat up about it for the longest time because this is the head coach who's seen the potentials and wants to play me. But now the assistant coach is um, changing me because he, he, he doesn't think that I'm ready to play yet. So I think that's one of the realizations we have got KCB is that it's not going to be easy because now we have to uh, measure up with everybody in the, in the team and not only the teammates, you have to uh, call the boxes for the coach to select you because if one simple thing like um, just the area of balls would make um, you not be selected for the team, uh, it, it meant that even though I was faster and could run with the ball, not score the tries. I had stepped to a different, a different um, kind of space when I, met, I, I joined KCB. I just realized this is a different space. You don't get, just get selected for one thing. You have to be an all-round all player. And uh, that's like the earliest memories of me in KCB were very tough because I'd met the teams, but I wouldn't play. I'd met the teams, but I wouldn't play. So I started getting frustrated initially when I, I joined the club. But um, I remember... Again, uh, the same same people used to talk to me, mostly Andrew. was like, you, you just keep doing whatever you're doing and improving on the small bits that you need to work, to work uh, on. And that's what I, I kept doing every single time. So uh, when I got selected for the, for the team or in the floodlight tournament that year, the fullback at KCB was Matthew Musita. And he was also the fullback at the national team center. So when I got... Uh, selected before him uh, in the team and uh, it was on merit. I remember him coming and uh, tapping my back and telling me um, good stuff. 
So it's just for you to, to, to go and represent and make sure you keep the jersey. This is one person that I actually respect was I made the team, meaning he got dropped to, to the second team, but he was um, big enough, he had a, a, big, a, big, a big personality to come give it up in the back and just tell me, um, this, is, this is the time that you can go and shine. And uh, that particular game, the very first game was against Nonis, and we got knocked out. I think that was 2013. We got knocked out in the, in the, uh, in the uh, floodlit tournament in the first game. So I get my first call up. I get my starting jersey. I get all the blessings from um, all these club veterans. And then we get knocked out in the first, very first game, game against Nordis. It was a very good, good Nordis side because they actually won the tournament that year. So um, the takeaway take take from that game is that uh, I really played well. And that's when my journey is really kick-started. Because since that time to, uh, to now, I've, I've always kept the jersey. So if it's the early days in KCB, it was never an easy journey for me. It was always um, playing off the bench and had to really impress before actually uh, before I actually um, cemented a position or maybe all the jersey in that club. I remember it was a very, very, very difficult job journey for me in the early days in KCB. Right now, uh, I think we have to enjoy the win. We have to enjoy the wins because we really worked hard for it. This is one thing I tell every single person that we meet because I remember the dark days in KCB. I remember the cool days in KCB. These are not, they were not easy days. We would play our A game. We would give them everything, but we would still come up second. If not second, they would beat us in the semifinals and they go ahead and finish the game. I think that period between 2014, 2013, and 2015, that Nakuru side really played a big role in in um, in uh, in building this KCB side that's playing right now. Because the hard work that we put back then, just to come second, really told us that we need to work um, like uh, over and above if ever we were to win that trophy. That's why uh, every single person who was in that um, KCB. Uh, period 2013 2015, we'll always go back, we'll always go back to that period and, and dig deep uh, or search those who are searching uh, in any different, uh, any difficult game. They'll go back and do a soul searching so that we are much that energy of the losses we got during that period because I've never been beaten that much in, in rugby, even in my Kisumu days. We'd be beaten in the finals or maybe the finals, but all through the league we'd be beating people. But that period in KCB. We really got hammered uh, left, right, and center by most people in a cool side. So, if you talk about experiences that build a team, I think that period really, really built um, a strong KCB um, rugby mentality that I think carries us on to date. You're now, now a dual international, uh, 7s and 15s. Um, yeah. What has the experience been like from your first call up to date in the national team? Uh, the first call up came, came in 20, 2013. I got called up with the same coach was uh, Felix Totti just before Paul Chu came in. But 2013 didn't really hold much for me because I never really got to play any games. But 2014, that's when I made my, I'd say, big break because that's when Paul Chu came and selected me again for the Sevens because I was called in. Uh, I got called in for the 15th side first before the Sevens, but since I wasn't playing in the 15s, they, uh, graduated. they just uh, picked me for the 7th team. So, um, working on Apple 2 was uh, a very, a very uh, interesting, interesting uh, period because I was used to, to, it's just 2014. So, it's not far since I played for Kisumu and I was just getting used to the, to the, um, to the KCB world. We weren't uh, world beaters yet, but we were doing some work towards that. So, Paul II regime was a very tough regime, if you ask anyone who was um, in the national team set up uh, at that particular time, because the South African style of, of, of training and, uh, uh, and, and, and operation was just, uh, it was just another level. It was very, very intense. And given that I'd never been in such kind of an environment, it was like um, a shock to the body, to the mind, to everything, because, um, if you just uh, fail to do something, it would take you back like 10 steps. So you always had to do catch up every single time. 
And even if you are at par with everyone, you always have to stay in your A game. Otherwise, you'll be left back again. So I think that experience uh, shaped how I perceived rugby. Because now it was not uh, just being talented anymore. It, was, it wasn't about just putting in the hard work anymore. It was uh, more about having the mental strength to um, help you go through the, the process, go through the training, go through the, 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 the competitiveness, go through the, the, the hard work or even the games per se. So I actually played for the sevens before I played for 15s. That's in 2015 Gold Cup. That's when I first uh, donned the, the national team in Jersey. And uh, I remember it being a very special time because um, uh, back then uh, making the team was very hard. It is still now, but it was very hard to you, for you to make a team with the, kind, the caliber of players that were in the squad at that particular time. And everyone at that time, the veterans were in their A game, the engineer and every single person. Then the young guns, which were me, I remember Kuto was in the side. I remember Mohanji was in the side. Ambunya was in the side. So even amongst peers, you still had a lot of competition. So for you to make the team, it was actually something um, very special. And uh, that's, uh, I went for, to Gold Coast and in the very first game, scored my first try for the country. And uh, I remember it very well because uh, immediately I scored the try, the person who commanded the try was Aga. And Aga, I know from, Augustine the girls I know from way back uh, in, in our Western, Western side rugby thing. And he told, he told me, because he was also making his debut in the same tournament, he told me, like, um, I remember that very well. And I was like, this hour, now let's go play. So having that confidence in the first game, I think really um, um, made me want more and made, made me want to uh, achieve more in my rugby career. So that's how I got my my sevens start, and that's how I, I, I got my my call up and, and my start. Then in twenty in twenty fifteen, twenty fifteen, I'd already been called up for. I was in the setup for since twenty thirteen to twenty fifteen. I'd been in the fifteens and seven setup, bouncing back and forth during that whole time. I'd played in the Elgon Cup as Kenya A in the fifteen side and all that. But my very first cup was in twenty fifteen. Uh, against um, Portugal, when now Jerome, uh, after the 2014 qualifiers, when he just missed the World Cup, but qualifiers going to the World Cup by a point, Jerome came and uh, did a whole uh, overhaul of the team. Some of, like most of the the, the older guys in the team, some of them retired or not, but there were others who are still in the team. Most of them still very very experienced. But the whole back three changed in that particular season. The whole back three, because uh, it was me, Samuel Yech, and Darwin. That's the, the back three that was selected for that particular game at the start of the season. And uh, I remember Jerome saying these words, because I'd been a bench player for the longest time. I was in the bench, but I never played. This is something that I've learned through my career. I make it to a team, I get selected, be the best that I've ever played. So when I go, when I get the, the, the chance or the opportunity to play, I usually make it a point to make sure I don't give back the jersey or I don't drop the jersey. I just have to keep the number for myself. So Jerome uttered these words. He, he was a very big, big fan of the six to split on the bench. Jerome never uh, believed in the forward kind of game mostly. So the six to split was like his best uh, combination in the bench. So for you to make the bench in the 15 side, you had to, to be either a specialist in your position if you are back, which is number nine, and uh, the other sub always had to be a utility player. If not, it had to be a number 12 because the guys in the field had to be utility players, so they would move around. So when the subs were being made, you'd get or get moving to 10 and someone coming in to 15 or be moving to 13 or David moving to full back. It was just that, that, that whole sequence. So in that particular jersey presentation, he said this, I'm going to name this young and inexperienced side, uh, uh, back three, and I'm going to put my faith in them. And I'm not going to, make, to name any subs for them. So if you are picking up the jersey, 
whether you're playing for 80 minutes, whether you're injured, whether you're crawling, whatever you're going to do, you're going to play for 80 minutes. That's my first test. And that's the very first words that I'm getting from the coach. So for me, it was, um, it's either you make it in this game or you're going to break it. Because there's no, you, you're either going to play poorly for 80 minutes or you're going to play good for 80 minutes because there's no way you're being taken off. And I think we took this as a challenge, the three of us. And uh, I think that was among the best games we ever played together. That season was immense. And that particular game really set up uh, the motion for the 15th side since uh, I started my, my career with them. And that's why those two games and were very special in my career. Yeah, so um, what have been your best and worst experiences in rugby? And also, what has rugby taught you as a human being? Uh, best and worst experiences. I think um, the best experiences uh, I just named them because it's been a, a stepping stone in each level of my career. First uh, was in the again the two hundred nine uh, surprises in category uh, really exposed me to the the rugby stage. So I think I got to the final of that game and uh, I really was in my, my career. Then I'd go to us. As qualifying, so qualifying to the Kenya Cup. I think of all the memories and all the trophies that I've had in my career, that usually has a very special, special, special place because um, it was a very damaged team that actually worked that hard to to get to 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 be promoted in the in the Kenya Cup. Then um, my first call up and my first tournament in Gold Coast in sevens that marks it in fifteens. It's uh, um, this period between 2015 and 2017. I think still starts to be the best season um, in the 15th I've ever had, had yet. Because really the rankings, I think it's the period where we had like the, the best ranking. And that season, this the game against um, Spain that um, really put that number back because Spain was on very high uh, or above us. Has to in that game, I think um, that's the best. I think that's the best feeling I've ever had in the uh, Simba jersey because then it was a start of something new. Everyone in that room that day after we won that game just knew now we had a chance to just take over the world. Uh, if you talk about worst experiences, um, uh, I think the 2015 season when it ended, when I got that horrific injury, uh, I think that has to top. That has stopped the, the list because uh, for for a minute I knew my career was ended. I just started because in that particular year, 2015, that's when everything was going good for me. That's when sevens came calling. That's when 15s came calling, and I was I was playing the games. I was really playing well at that particular time. Then KCB was on the up and up, and we had just uh, won everything in the in the in the in the league. We just won everything in the league. Sorry. Sorry, sorry. Sorry about that. Sorry. Um, yeah. I think, yeah, I was saying, um, it's not just one, like everything in the league, and we were, we were up and up. So, me getting that age, and we really um, uh, devastated. It was very devastating for me. Because it's not just the injury that devastated me, but. Um, I knew when I was being kind of out of that field that it might be the last time I was going to play. Because I still reached my leg, my foot, or my arm on walls. It was not, it's not, it's, I, I remember Cody telling me, um, it's okay. Uh, your foot is just fine. And I remember telling him, stop lying, watch out with the gun, because I could see how my foot was shaking and say that I reached it was. And me leaving that field, I knew there was a possibility I wasn't going to come back and play. So if you mark a dark period in my career, I think that that would top it. Um, the only other playing or bad memory when I was playing is just playing missing out in the side that went for the river times. I think for me, um, that personally didn't make sense for me. And uh, I think holding it in with 
really messed up my career. And uh, I think uh, I think I've done enough to make me decide. I think I worked hard enough because my motivation from the injury was to get back and to get fit before the next um, World Cup qualifiers. That was like one of my biggest motivators. I wanted to be fit to go play in the next qualifiers. So me missing out on that was just a downside. I think it was a downside in my career. So I think I'd pick those two as my worst memories in the game. Yeah, so I'd asked you earlier, um, what rugby has taught you as a human being? As a human being, rugby has taught me, first of all, to be very, very uh, hard work because I've been privileged enough to, to play in rugby with very, very good players. Um, very, very good players. And um, the thing about it is, every single time they raise the game, I had to raise my two. So the competitive nature just and I think I decided to Thomas because he was not going to, to operate the same level with someone they call the CJR international team, then I was not going to make, make the cut to even get selected. But the mere fact that he was playing at that high level and I was just competing or just catching up with them gave me a chance to at least fight for position. So it's really made me very competitive. I think it's also told me they taught me team up because uh, the, the people I played played with uh, all my life, you, you, some of them make most of them, my inner circle, the people that are the same people. And if you think that I want to do something, a venture, or something, something different, the same people that they work with. So team, teamwork has been very immense. And uh, it's also taught me perseverance. Because if you been, if you had what I've been talking about, uh, I've really had a lot of uh, ups and downs in my career. And, uh, the possibility to take all that and then try it into a positive energy and just uh, give myself the push to want to, to do more or to want to, to improve or to want to, to make it. That's one thing I learned from that because at some point, maybe I've just given up. But then you look at what you've achieved and uh, what uh, it's meant to you at that particular time and what you do more. So the possibility during the hard times, during the dark times, and then just push a little to want to do more, get it up in and do more. So um, hard work, determination, perseverance, and patience. Just work hard and be patient that the opportunity is going to show up and you're going to pick it up every single time. Well, remember you are watching this uh, webinar, this one-on-one -on -one interactive session with uh, Jacob Oje, Kenya 7's International, Kenya 15's International, and Celestine, Celestine Sinde from the Kenya Lionesses. This webinar is called Rugby Books and Entrepreneurship. We've talked exhaustively about rugby. We're now moving on to academics and we'll bring Sele back into the picture. Of course, we'll also bring OJ back into the picture. And the question is uh, for Sele, I'll start with Sele. Sele, you do have a bachelor's degree in accounting from St. Paul's University in Limuru. You're pursuing a master's degree right now at the Jomo Kenyatta University of Agriculture and Technology. The big question from many of the people who are watching is, how have you been able to juggle books, school, and your career? Yeah, um, it's been quite an um, amazing run, but it's also difficult at the same time. Uh, it's been very challenging throughout the years. Um, but what gives me the drive is, as I said, the fear of failure. I hate being broke. So, you know, I, I, I get my, my drive from that. Um, rugby, you see, I, I've gotten the privilege of playing rugby at such a young age in the national team. So it has taught me a lot. It's given me self-drive. It's given me the, the, team, the teamwork and um, you know ability to work with people, um, integrity at the same time, and just the drive to want to achieve more in life. So given, given um, that I was privileged enough to be able to excel in education, because that is not something also I take lightly, given the fact that I was able to do that and um, you know excel in my high school education, and be able to, you know, get called to a university and pursue my, you know, into further studies. That is something that I always advise these young girls. I, that is something that I always tell them. 
if you have an opportunity to further your studies, take it. Because some of us didn't have that luxury of, you know, being, uh, being able to, uh, you know, personally, um, I'll maybe take you back. In my, I went to State House Girls. And so in Form 2, uh, at the second form, I had really issues with paying my school fees. So my dad went to Rwanda and he, you know, he was mute for like four years of my life. So in Form 2, I had bills that I had to pay, um, that is school fees. My mom used to come with Njugu, uh, you know, and try and talk to the head teacher and tell her, you know, just allow my daughter because at least she's showing that she's able to do this. And, you know, she, she has the, the zeal and the drive to want to complete school and she's excelling in what she's doing. Just allow her to, you know, go for one term. Then I'd, I'd go for one term. That is in form two. And then the same thing, uh, she should go and convince the headmistress until I cleared um, my high school. And there's one thing that stood out for me because I am a very prayerful person. I'm a Christian, born, born again, speaking in tongues. You know, it's hard for people to believe, but that's, what, that's who I am. And that is how I was raised in a church. So I would pray and ask God, okay, what's happening? I'm doing my best, I'm working hard. And, you know, I'm trying to make ends meet, but from my end, but, you know, financially we are unable to do it. I, I, I prayed and miraculously I was able to finish my form four. And remember, I was not paying my school fees from form two, miraculously. So by the time I cleared fourth form, um, being prayerful and being born in a Christian family, my mom would just pray. And actually, after finishing my, my high school education, I was not able to join campus because of one, one reason or the other. Of course, money being a, a big part of it. So I had not gotten my, my form four, uh, you know, living certificate because I had not cleared with the school. It so happened that Kibaki said, you know what, everyone who cleared, uh, uh, you know, fourth form in 2004, go get your certificate. It was that miraculous. We jumped on the next Matatu and we went to State House Girls. And, you know, it was just a miracle. I got my certificates and pole pole, I was able to, uh, you know, to further my studies. So immediately I got my, 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 my fourth form certificate. There's one thing I did. I said, you know what, because I'm not able to join campus at, at this time, I'll start with a professional course. So I said, um, I'm good in, in, in maths, I'm good in numbers. Let me do CPA one, CPA one. Let me see if I'll be able to hack it. So I did it and then I excelled. Then I went to CPA two, part two. I did it, I excelled. I went all the way up to six. By the time I was done with CPAK and I was still playing rugby, remember at this time also rugby is teaching me stuff. You know, I'm, 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 I'm discovering myself in new ways. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm understanding myself in ways which I, I, I didn't before, um, becoming a natural leader and just, you know, uh, going through the ropes. So I did my CPAK at, uh, I, I did it in Visions, part one, I did it in Visions, then I went to Royal and so forth until I finished. So after finishing by that time, at least, you know, I was still, I was, I got my first job at, um, you know, I was doing just something fishy and, you know, I, I used to pay my school fees. I used to use part of that money. I pay my fees. I support my family, you know, and it went on like that until I was able to finish CPAK. I got a better job and then I decided to take myself now to campus because actually I'd been called in and, you know, I didn't have the means. So I joined campus after doing my professional course. So this is why I like to urge young, young, young girls and you know, young people out there, just because you don't have the means or the financial means, as long as you have a will, there is always a way out. And God looks at what is within first. You know, people might judge the outside, but God looks at what is within and then rather than you know, what is outside. So, you know, I used to pray every day and ask God, you know what, if I have the opportunity, if I have the chance, I will, I will, I will finish my, you know, I will go to the highest level in my education. And there you are, whatever you wish, whatever you put out there, the air you put out there, it will always come back to you. So I was able to, you know, uh, join campus. I did it until, you know, I got uh, first class honors in uh, finance. And then, because actually I'm, um, the same way I'm hard working on the pitch, is the same way I am with books. And you know, if you if you if you work hard, you know, if you put your best foot forward and you, you do your best, you let the you leave the rest to God. He will he will do his part. You know, the only thing we can do is uh, 
um, just try as much as you can to be the best that you can be at any one given point. So personally, um, that's my journey in terms of education. I started with my professional course, and then uh, I started paying my own fees. Mpaka then I, I joined campus, and right now I'm pursuing my master's. I'm almost finishing. But due to COVID and, of course, also rugby, I've had some pauses here and there. Uh, I, I took a hiatus for one year so that I could join my master's and, uh, you know, start my master's. Uh, immediately, I was done with my coursework. Uh, be right before I got to do my, um, my, my project is when I came back to, to try and qualify for this. Uh, that was 2018. So in 2019 is when I, uh, 2018 towards March, April there is when I rejoined. Um, yeah, I rejoined back to, you know, rugby and try to see if we can, uh, we can, we can get, you know, I can achieve far much more. Because as I told you, I feel like I'm not done with rugby yet. There's still so much to achieve. Um, I don't look at my age. I'm the kind of person who believes that I can be able to achieve anything I want. If I want a kid at 40, I will get a kid at 40. That is the kind of belief that I have. So I don't like, um, you know, uh, putting limitations in my life. So basically, um, I've, I've, I've come all this, uh, you know, I've come this far because of God. And with regards to my education, I know the sky is the limit. Uh, once I complete my master's, I will go on until I'm not able to. To do it anymore so i just thank god for for the ability to be able to do that yeah so now there's a question um how are you able to balance rugby study and work it's definitely not been easy um initially i was playing rugby for fun uh, because i wanted to see you know where it can take me and uh, because i had not joined school yet i wanted to keep myself busy and uh you know avoid you know uh, they, they say idleness is the devil's workshop so i was just trying to avoid being idle and you know just keep myself busy so i started by playing rugby i was not doing anything else um, you know i had all the time to train and be good and be great and do great things so then an opportunity to pursue my professional course came up i had to see how i could factor that in to my crazy lifestyle that is rugby and traveling um, it's not been easy for the most part, um, encompassing rugby to, you know, on top of books, but it just takes, in everything, it takes hard work, it takes determination, it takes, as uh, OJ said, you know, you persevere and endure the hard times. I would, I would, uh, you know, I would sleep late, wake early, trying to study and cover up for the time that I've lost while I'm on the pitch and others are busy studying and, and completing the course. So you have to go the extra mile and you know cover up the gap uh, for for you know the times that you've lost while others are you know busy pursuing the course so personally i was um I had to do my extra shifts and this is how i've been able to balance you see if you if you fail in um in if you fail in in in, in being able to balance that means you, you'll fail in everything that you do so for me i told myself if i'll be able to achieve the best balance then that means I will not lose out in rugby. I will not lose out in, uh, you know, my school. And because you go, you go to late night of, of, of studying and all that, and then you fail, you get an, you know, you get a, a, a B or a C. I've always settled for nothing less than excellence in everything that, that I do, such that if I fail, I don't, I don't go, you know, I, if a failure to me maybe is a B, you know, something like that. So I've always been able to try and balance to ex give my extra shift if I have to wake up early and cover up for the lost time, that is what I do. So fast forward, I got a job. Now I have three things that I have to do. I have rugby, I have to go to, I have to go to school, and I have to go to work. Um, the first thing I do in an interview is I tell my boss, um, you know, there's this question that comes after. Uh, tell us about yourself after you feel like you've aced the interview and you know that you're good to go. So I always tell them that if they're willing to support my lifestyle as a rugby player, as a sportsman, and as someone who's determined to work hard and, and work at odd hours, then we can do business. So this is the number one thing that I always say in interviews. Maybe probably that's why I've lost many jobs. However, this is the first thing that I tell them. I play rugby. I go to school because I'm always studying. I'm always doing something. If it's a professional course or whatever, I'm always, I'm always doing something. So I tell them, if you're able to support this lifestyle, 
and I give you what you want because I'm really good at working hard and achieving targets. So if you'll allow me to also do my bit and meet my, you know, both as an individual, then, uh, you know, we can work together. So basically it's just putting your foot down trying as much as you can to make them understand that you also have a life outside workplace and have them understand that you're trying to balance. And so long as you meet your targets at work, then what else? It, sh it shouldn't be a, a worry. And in terms of traveling, um, of course, it's a challenge. I, I try and work my leave base so that I'm able to at least achieve, um, you know, uh, after I've worked hard at work, I can be able to take my leave base and use it in rugby. So it's a blessing and a curse at the same time because it means that um, you cannot be fully professional like the men unless, of course, you know, um, you get paid well and, and, and have a contract and things like that. For, 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 the, for the women, we are not fully contracted, so we do it semi. So it kind of works for us because you're able to do other things and juggle and still maintain a balance in, in whatever you're doing. Hey, Jacob Oje, you are a Kenya Sevens International. You also play for the Simbas. You were in school for the better part of the past few years. You graduated with a degree in International Business Administration from USIU. So how are you able to strike that delicate, del delicate balance between, work, between school and, and rugby and obviously the other things that you're doing outside of the, of the pitch? I think, OJ, you'll have to unmute your microphone. Yeah. Yeah, you got my question, uh, right? I got your question. Yeah, I was saying, uh, uh, growing up, I had a very, um, I came, I got brought up in a, in a family that was uh, a, a bit well off. So uh, in my primary and high school uh, career, oh, schooling, I was just fine because uh, um, I went to, to good schools. I was taken to school through school with my parents but um after high school that's when like um stuff didn't go too well for us and now uh, it was um, a very a long period before i i went to college or campus because i finished school in uh, 20, 20 2009 and uh, the first time i enrolled in school was in 2012 2012 and uh, i did that because um um there were there were not enough funds for me to go to school so you getting your 70k or your 60k or 50 for a semester was just too hard. So what I decided to do was to enroll for the professional courses because at least uh, their fees were manageable because you just do a, a section and you either take a, a break if there's no money and you continue. So I enrolled for CPA in 2012. I did section one, which is part one and two in 2012, then moved to Nairobi. Moving to Nairobi, I didn't have the support to continue going to school because I wasn't doing anything and uh, uh, my parents weren't able to like pay for the, for the college or campus. So I didn't go to school again during that period uh, between 2012, me doing section part one of CPA, which is section and two, and 2014. So 2014, I got uh, called up for the national side. And that's when I got my first contract as a rugby player. So the first thing I did was take myself back to school again. So I enrolled for part two. I went to KCA now in KCA in, on Tika, the main campus, and enrolled. And uh, it was very hard at that period because I just got in this call up, got in my first contract in the national team. I need to impress so that I can stay in the team, but I also need to do school. And if you had me talk, talk about the Paul True era, you'll understand that it was never easy. Because back then, you used to train from uh, six, 6 in the morning to midday. That We used to train in, in, um, in um, Brook House, midday. And I used to stay in Gidurai, 45. So I have to wake up early enough by 4.30 or by 5, so that by 6, I mean, uh, Brookhouse. Brookhouse is the other side of town, almost you're going to Rongai, the other side. And then 
had to come back in between, back to Thikarod for, for my classes, and then go back, because we had two training sessions. We had to train in the morning between um, um, five or six and either 10 or 12. Then we had another session at the union, KRU grounds between five, from five to, to seven. So in between, I have classes. And in between, I have the bus rides and the traffic so that I can get to school and back. Back then, going to Ngong Road from Thikarod, you, you needed like two hours or three hours so that you are there on time. And getting back from Brookhouse to Thikarod with the, uh, the Langata Road traffic and Nyayo traffic, you needed another hour before you get to Thikarod. So I really struggled during that time. And I struggled mainly because I was a young guy who just made the team, got in the contract, and I wanted to impress in the national team side so that I don't get dropped. I wanted to make my tours, but I still needed to go to school. Because my first thing, uh, the first thing I wanted, ever wanted to do was to go back to school and finish my schooling. So I remember the build-up towards me uh, getting my first tournament, which was Gold Coast, I actually missed some classes. And uh, missing those classes meant I failed. Not necessarily failed, but I failed. I didn't get the grades I wanted at the end of the day. So at uh, the end of the of the six months because it is six months so whatever i got uh i got a fail in one of the of the, of the unit so i had to do the whole thing again and that's when i i really um made a very strong decision that i think has really helped me through since then to now any single time i have classes and i have exams i have to tell the rugby side and i have to tell the school side so that you find an in between if, I was, if I'm not going to get an in-between, then I'm going to choose one. And mostly, if I have exams and I have school, I've always chosen school and exams. So I'd rather be dropped or get dropped for that particular tournament or tour and then do this school thing and come work again from, the, from scratch to make it back to the team. So I think that really affected my first year in the national team because now I wouldn't be regularly selected for the tournaments. And even if I was selected, I, I wasn't available to go play because I wanted to go do my exams. Because I remember the, the next two tournaments was uh, Dubai and Port Elizabeth. And I remember having a very intense talk with, uh, with uh, Paul too, because then um, he wanted me to go to the tournament and I had exams during uh, Dubai. And I, and I told him, I can't travel to Dubai because I have exams and I have to do them. So it did, it did end so well, I remember. But what he did is we did, we did find a, an in-between so that I didn't travel to Dubai, but then I was uh, eligible for selection for PE because I remember me going to, to PE. Someone else came back and I went to PE. So that balance is usually very hard. And since then, I've learned to do one thing. When I'm in school, I get the whole course schedule <laughs> and how the semester is going to run. And then I'll ask for... The, the team manager in the team in the national side to give me the season's plan. So when you sit down with the two with the two um, with the two um, schedules, we get to see where I can play rugby and where I have to be in school. I can try uh, ask for permission from the school side to let me um, be off school for one or two tournaments, and then. I'd also ask the, the, the coaches and the training technical team staff to allow me to be in school for these particular moments when I need to be in school. So I think that's, that's worked for me. It's not been an easy ride because at times you get bashed from either side, but that's what I learned. And that's how I decided to, to approach this. So fast forward, I managed to do my uh, CPA. CPAs in case TA. And then that's what I was telling you 2015 was dark because when I immediately finished now uh, my CPAs in, in KCA and I was now free to pursue my rugby career, then I got this injury, this horrific injury. So uh, it was a time that I also needed to reflect on what I wanted to be next because now rugby was not uh, a possibility at that particular time. So um, what happened then is I started my company. It's, it was just a business then but it's, uh, it's now a registered company because I don't always had this passion to do, to, to, to do that. That's what kept me busy during that time, but it, was, it wasn't enough because I still needed to go to school. 
I know I hadn't gone to campus yet. I'd done the professional courses, but I wanted to go to campus. I wanted to take myself to campus. Now, the period where I was in national team side, I, I, I couldn't say I had uh, quite, uh, I, I would say, like um, an expenditure on my side. So what I did was I was just saving up for school. I knew I wasn't going to go to school soon, but when the time came, I, I needed to have the funds to go to school. So what I was doing is saving up. I had a kitty for school when I, during the period between 2014 when I had my contract to when I got the injury. So what I did in, immediately, like two months after my uh, injury, I'd gone for surgery and I wasn't even allowed to move around yet. But I remember just getting up one morning because um, I was tired of being, uh, I was tired of, of being, um, of, uh, of being uh, uh, depressed and just in the house doing nothing. So I went to USAU and registered for, for a course, the International Business Administration course. And uh, since I wanted to pursue uh, finance, I majored in finance. That's when I went back to school. It gave me a whole year of working in my, for working, um, in my school, school life before I even thought about rugby. So then it was easier because now I had only, rugby, or I had only school to, to concentrate on at least because rugby wasn't uh, anywhere near me getting back to play. And then I was, I was just, I was just depressed with life because uh, I think uh, that the dark days in that particular, particular period really taught me a lot. So I focused on school then and then started building my business. So I was juggling school. I, I go for my classes. Then I go to downtown. That's where we do most of our business and, and just try and, and, and do the business part of it. So when I got back to the rugby rugby scene and I, I got called back again to the national team setup. That was in 2017, 2017 uh, January. I just played like six months of really competitive rugby because I just gotten back for the club and was still, uh, um, I was still worried about the injury. It was still a mental block on my head. I was still fighting the mental uh, part of the game, but I got called back to the national team set up with Jerome, I remember, because I got called back for the 15th, not even 7th in 2017. So it got me, uh, that found me in my second year in, in campus. And I remember me going to him and, um, and telling him I'm still in school. So uh, it might be a problem between me playing or traveling a lot and uh, doing the school part. So we, we, we worked out something again using the schedules. So all the whole game, home games I was available to play. Uh, for the tours, I had a very supporting Actually, in school, I had a very supporting, um, uh, what is it called, like a uh, head of department, because they, they were now used to me going to ask for permission from them every single time. Then they would, t they would um, tell me uh, on how we'd go around it. So maybe I'd do some of, of the uh, assignments and stuff online and just submit. And I needed the letters from KRU uh, stating that I was out uh, on, 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 on sporting duties with the country. So that really helped in helping me balancing school and, 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 and rugby. But uh, last year was the most, uh, most um, challenge, challenging year now, because I was doing my fourth year in, the, in, the, in, the, in campus. And again, I got called back to the national team uh, sevens now. And in 15s, it's easier for you to balance because the season is very short and uh, and uh, the games, the away games are also uh, not so many. And uh, it just takes maybe a weekend if it's Uganda. If it's maybe Namibia and Zimbabwe, then that's a week, then it stretches a bit. But the seventh team uh, takes a lot of your time. Because if you're training, then it's ideally half of your day. So if you're doing school, it's, again, hectic to balance both. But I remember very well when uh, uh, the then coach, Paul, Paul Murunga and, um, and TM called me in. I asked them uh, about the schedule for the season. And then I went with my schedule for school, my, my school schedule and, and, uh, and showed them. I remember there was one part particular tournament or tour that they really needed me to be around, but I told them in January, the tour was in March, was it, it was in April, June, the Hong Kong, Singapore. 
I was doing my finals exams there. And then I was uh, due to graduate in August, September. So I told them there's no way I'm going to this tournament. So if I'm going to sign a contract to be in this team for this season, then I'm not going to travel to Hong Kong and Singapore. I think that cleared uh, enough, uh, a lot of stuff for, for me and for them because they knew that at that particular time, I was not going to be available to be selected. I think it's easier for me to, to work like that. So whatever tournaments in between, I had to find a way to convince the school to, to at least let me go play those tournaments. But for this particular tournament, because I was sitting my final exams, I had to be in school. So what I'm saying ideally is, um, if it gets, it got to a point where I needed to decide on, on, on school and rugby, if I didn't find an in-between, then I'd easily uh, select to do the school part first then I knew I'd get back and just train, even if I missed a tour or miss selection and get the, get play the next tournament or the next tour. That's how I, 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 I pushed myself because I knew if I'm not going for this tournament, means someone else is going to play, meaning that they have the opportunity to keep the jersey. So what I need to do when I come back is try to level up and, and meet them at the game or just try to make the team next time. So if you... It's about balancing academics and, 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 and rugby. It's been a bumpy road for me, but uh, given that I've been the one uh, financing my, my school, schooling all this while, I think it, it made sense for me to at least give, make sure I finish school. I needed rugby to stay in school, but I also needed rugby to let me be in school. So those two things had to, 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 to really um, work together for me. So I finished school last year, in, in Yosai last year. I wanted to do my, my master's immediately. But then I remember having a talk with Ogweno, the, the team manager. And he was like, next year is the Olympic season. Why don't you, don't you think it's wise enough to take maybe time off, a year off? You, do, you commit to rugby and do this part. And then after you can you can go back to school for, for your master's. And it's an idea I thought of. So for me, it made sense because this year was Olympic season. That was in, the talk was last year. So this year was an Olympic year. So I took a break off school this year um, after graduating last year so that I can concentrate on the rugby part. Then um, maybe later in the year, I was to make a decision on when I was going back to, for my master's, which was ideally next year. So now, since the COVID thing happened, I don't know where what decision I'm going to make until maybe the games resume. But as for school, um, it's been tough. And I usually tell even the young kids, it's very tough when you get into the limelight and you get into playing into the national team side and uh, you also have school. But it's something you have to how you have to work around. You have to do both. There's no way you're going to concentrate on one and uh, and, and not do the other one. Yeah. If one thing, if there's one thing the, the injury in 2015 taught me is uh, uh, rugby is, is, is a very good game, but the injuries can come at any time. The, the, the um, lifespan of a sports person is very short. Say you, you do it without injuries and you have a, a good career and uh, like uh, you can go to 35, 36, maybe, if you're, if you're very committed and you're very good. But at an instance, something can happen that can change the whole aspect or the whole view of how you're going to live your life. For me, it was the injury. I'd gone to school and done the CPAs, but for me, it was not enough to kickstart a career off rugby. So that's why, why I made the decision to go back to, to school and try balance both. The business came in between, made it even harder. But uh, the business side, Initially, when I used to go to tours or play rugby, I used to like um, um, put it on the on the back end a bit. So it never really took off, or the business never really grew. But uh, the past year, the past six months or eight months, I've had a partner. I made a decision to get a partner so that they can help me uh, grow my business and uh, do rugby and do school at the same time. So the business has also taken off. At least on that side, I got someone to help me. 
But when it comes to school and rugby, you just have to find the in between. For mine, it was um, getting to see the whole season plan, getting to see the whole uh, course schedule from the school, and finding the in between whereby I'm in school, I'm doing well, and uh, I'm also in rugby, and I'm also excelling in the same side. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot, OJ, for those insights. Thanks also, Sele. Now we're going into entrepreneurship. Remember, we are talking about rugby books and entrepreneurship. I believe we've already talked about the rugby journey, the academic journey. Um, going into entrepreneurship and uh, starting with you, Sele, what inspired you to go into business? What inspired you to focus on the health food sector? Uh, what is the inspiration behind Selema's health products and uh, in particular the hibiscus juice that we were talking about prior to going live? Okay, so thanks Kwambo. Um, um, uh, you know, this is a platform that I'm grateful because uh, it can help, you know, if it can help someone, then I'm all for it. Um, basically, entrepreneurship is, um, it's, it's a big word, it's very equivocal. Um, I, I, I was born into a bloodline that is actually full of business savvy women. Um, none of my sisters is actually employed apart from myself and our firstborn who is still pursuing business on the side. So business runs in the, in the family, uh, including my mom. And so that is kind of what kickstarted my you know, business savviness. Uh, I remember in, high, in primary, I think it was class seven, eight, my sister and I used to make these ice lollies and, you know, we used to sell them to uh, our neighbors and, you know, just things like that reminds me every day, you know, why I do what I do. Um, so what started and what inspired the Hibiscus brand, uh, it's actually here, I don't know if you can see it. So this is a uh, hibiscus juice made out of hibiscus flowers and ginger, we'll get to that. Um, what really inspired me is I remember in Rio 2016, um, uh, in the Olympics, uh, I remember we were in the village. It was called, uh, I think I, there was a name for the dining hall where we used to go and dine and you know eat any kind of food you wanted. If you wanted junks, there was a whole section for junks. Then there was a whole section for healthy stuff. So I was kind of lured at the time to the you know things that you've never eaten or seen before so I, we'd go and even take pizzas for breakfast the next day you can take a smoothie burger so things like that but i remember the last uh, two days because there was this section for healthy stuff healthy stuff and i got a liking to it because as a sports person you always struggle with eating healthy you know you'll eat something that's you know uh you eat like a pizza and you just you just beat yourself up for it you feel like oh now i've gained how many pounds so I remember the last two days, I was like, you know what, this, it was actually two, three, the three days of the tournament. I said, and now I'm eating healthy, you know, no, no longer trying to, you know, do shady stuff and uh, looking at where my TM is and just sneaking in a pizza. So I decided, you know what, let me just try out something different. Um, so there was this section for drinks, drinks only. You can imagine this is the Olympics village. There's all kinds of drinks that you want. So there was this section that had this um, um, hibiscus drink, but I can't remember the name of that drink. So I went and tasted and I was so shocked that it was flavorful, tasty, a fun drink yet. When I asked, I was told that it's still healthy. So that kind of uh, started my kick, started my journey to actually find a way and a balance for, you know, doing something, impacting people's lives. And yet, you know, um, bring out a, or, or, or launch a product that is helpful, uh, you know, playful, fun, and it, it can be an, an, a healthier alternative. So once I tested it and I got a liking to it, I came back home and, you know, I approached my sister. My sisters, you know, were all talking about the Olympics and all that. So I told them, you know what, I've had this drink and it's really amazing. I think this is it. You know, this can kickstart an empire for us. So they were like, hmm, that's nice. And then we swept it under the rug. So fast forward in 20, after the Commonwealth Games, that is 2018, I came back and told them, you know what? At least I've gotten some money. Let's, let's just try and get into this thing. So my sister Carol was like, wow, um, yes, uh, because I also have some money in this other business that I'm doing. 
if you're willing to partner, let's do it. But we have to include our other sister, who's our cousin, basically Judy, my former boss. So the three of us sat down and we were like, um, I told them, I sold them, the, uh, I sold the idea to them. I told them there's this health drink, yeah? it's a West African drink. So it's just a hibiscus flower. You mix it with ginger, the plant, you use them, all of them raw, so that it's an organic drink and it's helpful. It maintains all the nutritional benefits. So use uh, hibiscus flower, then they, we can use ginger because actually I researched and Googled about it. And uh, in West Africa, the drink is called uh, Zobo. So, you know, I told them this is how we mix it. But then of course I was speaking from a layman's, you know, I'm not a mixer. I, I was speaking from a layman's perspective. They picked up the idea and Judy, who is also a big part of the Selema Cell Products and also a director of Masatec Limited, bought into the idea and said, you know what, Sele, I'll sponsor your dream. I'll sponsor your idea, I'll sponsor your vision. You tell me what you need. Um, so there you have it. Um, we went, this, this was 2018 now towards the end. We went uh, to, the, to Kirdi and, uh, you know, went to school. We were taught how to mix it and, you know, it went through all the tests. So I told them, this is how I want it. This is the vision that I have. And uh, together, the three of us as the founders, you know, we kind of played with the idea and finally a product came that I was actually confident in. I loved the taste. I loved the, it has some citrusy in it. Um, you know, it just came all together what exactly I had envisioned. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, it took us like, uh, you know, almost from 2018 around like four months the last quarter of 2018, we're trying to design and come up with, uh, you know, the label, the branding, and, and uh, this is when we decided to go with the Hibisco. It's a, it's a Hibisco brand uh, under the Masatec umbrella. This is Masatec Limited. Um, the, we're trying to, like, um, uh, I don't know, it's, it will be called, uh, there's a name for it. So what we're trying to do is branch out, out of Masatec Limited, because basically it's an umbrella and it has many things. So Selema's health products is actually a branch of, um, of the Hibisco drink, where now this is going to be a home of many drinks, of many health products. That is the food and drinks that we are about to bring. Um, we've started a test run with the Hibisco drink, which is doing really well. With just under one month of sales, but of course years and years of preparation, it's actually, we've now sold over 1,000 as of last, uh, earlier this week, what, 900 and something. We just under one month of sale. So basically it's a drink that we've seen people embrace. It's an immune booster. It has 50% um, uh, vitamin C, vitamin D and iron. It's good for your health. Um, you know, it helps in uh, reducing blood, um, uh, blood fat levels as well as regulating blood sugars. It's basically just a fully loaded uh, health drink that is organic to the core, no preservatives, no chemicals added. Um, I like to urge sportsmen to actually try it out and uh, you love it. I think we have a deal with uh, OJ, but we'll get to that. <laughs> but in fact, Sele, as you, as you speak, there's a question from, from one of the people watching. How much is it retailing for? Um, basically, right now it's retailing for the small one. Uh, we sell it at 200. The, this one liter goes for between 400 and 500, depending how many pieces you're taking. So we can retail from 400 to 500. And we have five liters, which is going for uh, between 1500 to even 2K, depending on how many pieces you're buying. That is something that you know, is down to uh, negotiations. So, okay. yes, okay. yes. And uh, before we bring in Jacob OJ to talk about the outlook, uh, what are some of the challenges you have faced? Because obviously, like you said, it had been a bumpy ride. So what are some of the challenges you faced uh, en route to coming up with this uh, product in your journey to entrepreneurship? Yeah. So basically also something else that um, I should have mentioned, uh, the three of us, um, myself and my two sisters, were founders. And um, I got this amazing, amazing other partner that's also a Kenya 15s a captain, Samson Onsomu, who um, we met up and he, we agreed to partner and be the face of the drink. So I'm in partnership with uh, Samson, uh, you know, Kenya 15s International, and I thank God for that. 
uh, basically we've endured a lot of challenges um, you know in getting the product out there first and foremost is the self-doubt and 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 the financial bit of it uh, this is actually like an empire and uh, it's um it's some it's a movement that we're trying to make and so it has to take a village it can't just be me with the ideas and you know trying to you can you can kill yourself so that is why i decided to you know approach people that support me that love me and that fully fully buy into the idea of making a product that not only will sell or, or transcend the market but something that i can believe in something that i'll take you know, even before the games, being a sportsman that I am, I still have some time left in the sport, in the sport. So, you know, it was challenging, number one, the financial bit. It was challenging. Hence, you know, having to get partners and, and, and come together as a team to create it. Um, another challenge in having a health drink is getting the certificates as well as getting it approved. It took us, given COVID, it took us such a long time to get it approved and you know just have the you know the cab sticker because initially the idea was just you know let's make a drink and we were so excited and thought that it would be everything let's put it in chandarana this uh, we wanted to take it to chandarana shop right game and this these were our ideas but then later on in the journey we realized actually online sales is, is far much more easier and and you have some sense of control over it uh in terms of the credit periods it's also uh, you know it's advised that you, you use mostly the online basis because if you take it to a supermarket you find that the challenge is uh, you know you have like 120 days credit period you know it's a small business how do you sustain us how, how do you sustain that and still you know and you're still in business so that That's financial true. of it mm -hmm. and you know, getting the, the thing approved um getting people to buy into the idea that self-doubt uh, people telling you that, you know, this is not going to go anywhere. How many businesses have people started and, you know, it, it gets to stop. So that just, you know, was a bit challenging at, at first. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Sele. OJ, you are the face of the Outlook. It's a brand that we've seen time and again. And I mean, what was the inspiration? I know you touched on it. And then another question is uh, why the fashion industry, uh, the inspiration behind the outlook and the challenges you faced in pushing the brand to where it is to this point? Uh, I was saying um, the outlook is uh, is an idea that I had from from way back. It's been in existence for 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 six years since 2014. But the the idea or the motivation behind behind it uh, goes back 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 for for me because uh, initially um, the inspiration was just I love to listen to music uh, and specifically hip hop hip hop music. So when you when you listen to such kind of music, maybe in the early 2000s and the mid 2000s, when you listen to hip hop, there was just one one um, one factor that stood out. They all had like a, a fashionable way of way way of dressing, and uh, most of the big big people in the music industry rap industry had like um, outlets, uh, clothing outlets. Um, if you talk about Jay Z, then they had the rocker wear. Talk about PDD, then they had uh, Shan John and all, and that kind of of, of um, those kind of uh, of examples. So that's where the 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 interest, I'd say. Oh, that's where I picked my 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 interest of fashion and just trying to just like another kid growing up trying to to mimic or pick up stuff that you see uh, on TV that you you might like. Then uh, the inspiration actually came by me seeing the hype that came with um, one of the international acts putting on uh, Kenya, uh, Kenyan clothing. Because uh, I remember there was a hype around uh, mid-2000, I think 2005 or 2004 with Econ. Econ had came, uh, came to Kenya back then and uh, he bought this uh, hoodie from the Jamuhuri wear. 
if you know if if you know it from back then i don't know if it's still uh, as active as as it was back then but Akon had it on one of his music videos and uh it, it went viral there was no internet back then but uh, uh no there was no uh, uh social media huge traffic on social media back then but there was word that echo put on a hoodie that was made by jamu Huriwea. so that uh, i think i didn't realize realize it back then but it clicked that actually later on in life it clicked that uh Bazi had actually uh been trend centers in something kenyan again so growing up uh with this in mind i i started doing branding way back i think in high school with a friend of mine um we had in kanulotunga the rugby team did had like um the best uh kids or maybe whatever we had teams like maseno are very flashy so when you went to tournaments you knew maseno was here or oh, yala tried with the with their with their clothing too but the other teams guys just came in with their rugby wear apart from that it was your game skits and that was it so i remember a friend of mine gregor maybe he's watching he came up with an idea of us making our own t-shirts so him he, he came from nairobi uh he used to come from nairobi uh to school so it was like oh, i can find someone who can print something for us in our you know t-shirt then maybe when you go for the tournament you can be putting this one on and i was interested i was intrigued and interested in the same thing so i remember us doing that and uh the 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 response or the excitement or of other teams rather school schools seeing us putting on that uh was like the first uh indicator that you can actually be unique you can do something with uh, whatever you want to do in terms of clothing and you can be unique with it so fast forward to some some rfc and our huge tournament which is uh dollar sevens so now uh for the few first few years in 2009 and 2010 when we were playing dollar sevens we just used to have them the t-shirts the dollar sevens t-shirts and i remember they were being made uh by ministry of rugby ministry of rugby uh Ariki and, and co so i think in 2010 uh we approached the committee dollar sevens committee me and owila owila used to be my creative for the longest time until date he's very good with drawings and just coming up with random stuff so we approached the dollar sevens committee to let us do that year's dollar sevens t-shirts and uh they gave us the go ahead minister rugby was still doing theirs but we were given the go ahead to do ours and uh, since we're not uh, being paid allowances or anything in kisumu we had uh, uh we had um, vouched for us being the t-shirts then the players selling them and whatever they sold them for they would just give back the the uh, capital the production cost and keep the rest as uh, their own allowances for the tournament and this became a very big hit because um, the design we came up with the you villa know, i think is still among my favorites designs that we have ever come up with it's the fish with the number 7 uh, on it and i think i still have it or villa still keeps it is like um that's when the interest of doing this personal branding and clothing just really hit me so from there i did a couple of t-shirts again i did masaku t-shirts for um some few friends uh, then i did uh I, when i came to kcb i first of all before i even started at outlook i was doing the kcb t-shirts i remember back then colin skimani who was the scrum of uh, uh kcb back then used to do the kcb t-shirt so when he left for to western i'd ask him if i could continue doing the same then i, I said just started doing it then one day having this idea of wanting to have my own personal brand uh i, I think uh I, it was just time be, uh, time before i actually actualized it because i'm one person uh, who okay i have a lot of ideas but it take a lot of time to plan and maybe to try and execute it so i had the idea for a while but i didn't have the name i didn't have the name outlook back then i didn't even know what i was going to call my brand i just knew that i do a brand a clothing line at some point so i remember my younger brother who also is also huge in the in, the, in music and likes a lot of music was like a how we were just talking random, random talks how can you just um watch the video and uh, the clothing in it oh uh, it was a kenyan video but the the guys in it are not as flashy as the just ended song which was a a western song and uh, i remember him making a random a random um uh, say like uh, how do you just walk out and you don't look good 
get, you're supposed to be looking good every single time you step out. So he was like, and then I asked him like the outlook, like how do you walk out when you look? It was just a cliche word. It wasn't even something like was really thought of, but that name just stuck on my head. How do you just walk out and you don't look good? So it's outlook. Every single time you step out, you're supposed to be looking good. Or every single time you 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 go, you want to do something. If if you want to 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 go to a meeting or you want to go to a, a party or whatever thing you're doing, you're just supposed to look good. So it was like a saying between me and him. Every single time you step out, you're just supposed to look good. And the word they are just stuck in my head. The outlook. So my brother knew I wanted to start a a business, clothing business, but. Uh, we didn't have a name. So in the next few weeks, I just went out. I, I remember me soliciting money from my brothers and, and my, just my family members. They didn't know what I was doing with it. I just told them I need to do some project. Uh, you'll see it when it comes out. Then I went, I remember printing the first 50 t-shirts because I didn't have the market yet. I didn't have, and it was just, I was taking chance in something that I believed in. So I remember doing, there's that uh, very first uh, design we did. I call it the pioneer. So I went out and uh, did it. And uh, I printed 50 t-shirts, just randomly um, thought in my head, if I play for KCB and have this number of friends, at least then buy a few. Then I have my family members who have to buy the stuff. For them, it's never a question of whether they're going or not. They just have to buy the stuff. So I did the 50 t-shirts. And uh, I remember it was a, a game at KCB at the den, and they carried all the 50 t-shirts. And I never came back home with even one single piece. So that's how I built my capital for my for the business. That's how the business started. I remember we were going for Singa, it was in 2014, Singapore, the tournament in Singapore, and I was a guest player at the Impala team, the, the team that used, used to go for the Singapore tournament. Again, I carried a few pieces, and everyone in that team bought every single T-shirt. And uh, the feedback I was getting it is just, it's good, it's unique, it's cliche, but it's very nice. So that's where my inspiration came from. That's how I actualized it. It was never something thought of. It was just something that came off the name, actually. The business part or the, the thinking behind the, the, the brand I had all along, but the name, that's why people usually ask me, what does it mean? I just tell them it was a, um, a, just a random thing, a random chat, and the name just stuck. It is, it's cliche, but it has meaning itself. So that's how it started. And... Um, from there, I went and registered it in the same same year. I think after a few months, registered it as a business. So initially, it was just clothing, and uh, and uh, and that's it. I was just doing Outlook clothing only. I was just do from t-shirts. I graduated to hoodies, then pants. I remember back then also uh, uh, my friend Joji Asin was doing uh, pod. He just like commercialized it because for him the idea was friendship, but he commercialized the idea. So. We used to run around river and trying to look for all these uh, suppliers, if it's getting the fabric or getting the right people to make the, the brand. So um, we just bounced off ideas off each other. And I remember just doing hoodies, sweatpants, sweatshirts, and t-shirts. And that was the case for Outlook for two or three years. It was a business, but it hadn't like reached its, peak, its potential. Because remember now I had school also and rugby. And I, I told you guys earlier that uh, when I had a lot of things um, surrounding me, I would then put the business aside and try and uh, juggle the two, the rugby and the school. So my business did like take off completely. But then um, uh, moving forward, Pole Pole started having uh, different people asking me if I could brand for them their stuff, not necessarily do Outlook for them, but brand for them their stuff. Initially, I was I, I didn't I didn't like doing that because I wanted you to buy my stuff and uh, and promote my brand, but then I realized there's a bigger market for Outlook than just my clothes or my brand. That's the face of the of the of the, of the business. It's the clothing, the Outlook clothing. That's the the face. But in a broader perspective, then uh, Outlook is just anything branding. So I had the idea for a while. So I started doing for people, I started doing um, events. I could do baby shower t-shirts or I could do fresh, I, like those small, small events, people would like hit me up and I would make them, uh, I would make for them the stuff or do t-shirts or hoodies and stuff. 
and brand it whatever they wanted. So that um, broadened a bit the, the, the business uh, that Outlook was bringing in. So apart from me selling and pushing for my brand to grow, I also had people uh, co contacting the business to do their branding for them, meaning that only gave me one assurance, the quality was good and the workmanship was also, was also good. So um, it went on for a few months and now corporate started hitting me up for the same. This is majorly from either the posts on Facebook or referrals from clients or friends who had picked up a few of my items. So I was building a network, the network was growing. So I started doing the corporate stuff, like uh, I would make hoodies for this uh, team or this company, I would make corporate shirts for this team and, and so on and so forth. With that, I also had to like um, source for the right people to make this stuff because now I was, I was going into uh, uncharted waters because mostly it was just hoodies, pants and t-shirts. Those, those are very easy because I was already in that field. But now if someone tells me they want corporate shirts for the company, then I had to broaden my, 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 my reach on which uh, maybe Fundi would make that. That made me dwell even further. Because now, if I could make shirts, and now I got someone who could make suits, now I started doing weddings again. So I get contracts, so get contracted to, to do weddings. My brother-in-law is a, photog a wedding photographer, so it's, it's very easy to get clients from him. Because now when he goes to negotiate, let's say, um, a, a wedding photo shoot, then you would, you would just pitch it to them that you can also do uh, your clothing for you if you haven't found, found someone yet. So we started moving towards that direction. So we did that up for a while, uh, just as a business, but then I got a partner because it was now getting heavy because I had school, then I had rugby. And now I could not put the business on the side anymore because maybe the tour came in between me having a contract to do a certain job for a certain company. So there was no way I was going to put that on the, on the side. I had to have it uh, done. So um, I got a partner who is my sister. My sister stepped in and, and, and she was like, I've seen you do this thing for a while and I've seen the, 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 the stuff you do and the brains, but I think I can pitch in something different, which is the managerial part of it because she's, um, she's so corporate. So she understands that part of the business. And um, she she joined forces with me. Now, it was just a matter of time for us to give this business a, a model now. So we started planning on how to register the business as a company. And uh, we managed to do that and got all the certifications uh, that's required for it to operate as a private limited company. And now we got even, because uh, now we're even chasing tenders with the same company. So I remember a tender opportunity came, some a few tender opportunities came by, but we were not able to apply for them because one, we were not a company or we didn't have these certifications, the ACPO, the youth and all those certifications. So all these opportunities kept just passing us by. And then initially when I used to do the business, even for the corporates, I didn't get the recommendation letters and stuff. So all these things had to be put down in planning and you needed to, you, I needed a person to help me to do the same. So that's where my sister came in. So we did all this stuff and I started applying for the tenders and started getting the tenders. So registering the business as a company actually broadened, broadened the objective of the company. So we have the Outlook, which is the cloth line, which is the face that everybody knows. And then we have Outlook, which does every single kind of branding and merchandising that you would want to do. So apart from the clothing stuff only, we can do any other branding that you want. Because now we've been able to build a team, not necessarily employees of the company, but you built a network whereby if you wanted your cards branded, made, you had to get cards and brand them, you get them. If you wanted, like now we're doing, uh, we're doing this um, tender for some uh, construction company. So you have to do the helmets and you have to do the overalls and you have to do all that stuff and brand them. So registering the business made it uh, uh, a general supplies merchandising and, and branding business and that's where we are right now uh, at this particular time outlook has the growth line which is still my major focus because for me picking picking from the jamuhuri and the vazi who are the initial like the pioneers in the uh, 
throughout the game that's to me for me growing up I, at least i remember jamal Huri and i remember Vazi. so what i wanted to do is uh make outlook uh my goal is to make outlook a clothing outlet in the country even if it's just starting with nairobi so i can go to town and get my shop there like the outlook shop brand yeah. shop the same way you can do with surprise i know it's it's uh it's uh it takes a lot it'll take a lot but it's a dream that i've had and the fact that i've come in the six years i can only see it happening than it failing because again um for me the, everything i do i think i think i at least try and give it my my best and uh, i don't like failing so i'd rather take it slow and it can take even 10 15 or 20 years but it's something that i'm really looking forward to actualizing and that's my drive the other part now is what drives the business because now that's where the, the the most business has been coming for the past uh, let's say six seven months it's been corporate merchandising major for 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 the business then uh the stuff we've been doing in the marketing is again online i had to say talk about it because um i tried doing the 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 thing whereby you um, you do clothes then you take them to a few outlets in town then when they get get uh, sold you get you give them a, a percentage or you just give them a prize then whatever markup they they put on the prize it's theirs to keep but it didn't work so well because you, you you rarely get people who you get understanding with because you'd stock a shop the 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 clothes are sold but you never get paid your 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 bit so we just decided we're not going to do that we're going to concentrate on the online uh, marketing and pushing because now there's a lot of social media a lot of traffic on social media when you look at all the handles and uh, it's get a simple like or a simple retweet or, or a simple share goes a long way because that's where i get most of my clients nowadays it's, it's apart from the friends that usually just call in and order i've done a lot of orders that i don't even know people because um it was just shared and appeared on their page and they liked uh, whatever presentation was being made and they ordered for it so until maybe we get a shop of our own, I think uh, social media way it will be just the social media platforms will be our major uh, uh, concentration point with regards to to the business moving forward. Well, obviously, OJ, um, you are usually a common collected player on the field. Even now, as you talk about the journey with uh, Outlook, you make it look so easy. But obviously, you've had some challenges. Maybe just very quickly, you can share one or two of those challenges? Um, the challenges, are, I've had a, a number of challenges, but um, the major one initially was to, uh, was team building mostly, to get the, the right people to do the best work possible so that you can, um, you can put this out for consumption to your, your clientele. Um, Team building uh, is broad, but to break it down, it just means tailors getting um, uh, continuous supply from maybe the, where you get the fabric from. If you need to get a, a fabric, you need to get consistent supply. And the other one used to be branding. So first of all, you need the right tailor. Every, there's, a, <laughs> there's a joke that everyone knows about fundies and how they behave. So you give your order and uh, they tell you to come tomorrow and then you come a week later and they still tell you to come tomorrow. So it's just um, something that we tried. I really struggled with initially because uh, initially we did have a workshop. So we outsource uh, for the service. I'd go to uh, a tailor and get an understanding with them so that they can be making my stuff. So for them, this is a side hustle. It's not like their main stuff. So they usually push it. Uh, back and do their stuff until it's last minute and they don't have any other thing to do. So I really, uh, it really took me a lot of time before I found the right tailors or the right team. Because um, once you, got a, you get a tailor, then you don't get the fabric. Because now uh, we're still doing the business initially and uh, the consistent supply of the same fabric and you don't have the, um, I didn't have the capability to maybe import my own fabric so that it's consistent enough and stuff. So you'd go the same shade of gray that you had yesterday is not the same shade of gray that you have today. And the client still wants the gray that was there yesterday. He said, as in the fabric part is still a challenge to date, but it's at least manageable because now at least we can stock up. 
So if I can stock up for say a few orders, then I'm sure I'm going to get the right shade or whatever I need to get at the time. Then the branding now, after the cloth is ready, and now you need to get it branded. Um, branding is a very, um, it's very, very specific with, the, with the, the design you want to put or you want to make. If you don't get the, the right person to do it, then it's going to be your, your source for all the losses you're going to make. Because you've invested in the fabric, you've invested in the workmanship, which is the tailors, the cloth is ready, but then the simple part or the tiny little part uh, that remained, which is uh, to put the brand on the cloth, is when, where the clothes end up getting spoiled. So for me to get the right person, it used to cost a lot back then. And uh, these kind of people who do how to do the best work didn't want to do the small scale kind of, um, of work. Like I take them 10 shirts or three hoodies or five t-shirts. They, they wanted to deal with mass. So for them, for, for them to do for you 10 or less, it meant you were supposed to pay double for the same. And if you take it to the other people who are ready to do the stuff for you, then it would end up making losses because they, they do a shoddy job. So team building was really, really, has been really, really challenging for me. But at this particular point, uh, at least we have our own workshop. So we do our own, our own, our own uh, production. We stock the fabric. We have the tailors on, 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 the, on, the, on the payroll. So that at least you're sure at that part, even the branding part, we have a steady person now who can do it for us. So you're sure at that part. The other, the other thing, uh, just before to touch on the last thing before, before on the challenges, before I finish on the challenges, initially it was cash. Cash is just everything in the business, and uh, um, that much we didn't have that much cash starting up. I didn't have a lot of capital starting up. As I told you, I just had uh, solicited money to do 50 t-shirts, and from there I built the capital. So there's a time we'd get orders and stuff, but um, these people wouldn't pay even maybe the, pro the the deposit and stuff. So you'd be making stuff on credit. And you're making stuff on credit that you don't have already. You can't give credit because you don't have the money. If I had the material with me and I'd make them, then at least go get the cash and I'm delivering. But now you don't even have money to go get the fabric and, and deliver. That big that was like the biggest challenge. Because now for something that would take me a little while it would take me longer because now I had to source for the money again. And uh, from that, uh, I learned a lot because even the orders you're getting, you deliver them and still they take ages before they pay up. That was very, very challenging for me and, uh, and the business when you were starting up and even to death. That's why I, I rarely take job, I do jobs on credit because now if you don't have the cash to operate, then you can't operate at all. Every single person wants uh, in, the, in the team, like the tailors and the fabric, they have to be paid upfront or immediately they finish their job. But now this is cash that we didn't have back then. So I think that was the biggest challenge even in trying to grow the business because you want to stock up on fabric, you want to put someone on a retainer so that they can work for you uh, uh, on the regular basis, but you didn't have money to support the same. So I, I, I think that's where um, me getting the right people to work with and me getting a partner really helped. And uh, that's when the business like um, started growing on a, on a steady pace. Yeah. Wow, it's been an amazing one hour, 54 minutes. We had planned this uh, session to probably last about one hour, 20 minutes. So there's so much we can talk about. We're heading into the home stretch. But before that, I'd just like to acknowledge the viewers who are watching on Facebook, the likes of Sarah Lynn Notieno, George Mukwasi, among others. Uh, there's also a comment from Joseph Babu, who is one of the participants here, who's probably urging you to, he's asking if you consider other types of business, would you, what, what would push you to venture onto the other types of business? Um, I believe that's a question we'll try and answer in the next few minutes. Um, as we head into the final bits and pieces of this session, what motivates both uh, Sele and OJ? We'll start with you, Sele. What is uh, your motivating factor generally and 
what word of advice is it that you have to young people looking to venture into sports and also into um, activities outside of, of sport? Are they able to strike that balance? OJ will also get those words from you as we wind up. Okay, for me, I would say what basically motivates me, I'd mentioned earlier, is fear of failure. You know, I hate failing, so I will do everything. I will, I will just do everything. Even if I will have to, you know, climb Mount Everest, I'll do everything to ensure that I don't, I don't fail. I hate being broke um, because I've been there. So that's basically my drive. And apart from that, you know, um, as a sports person, you know, you get to inspire many. You get to be on a platform whereby you're placed on a pedestal where people can judge uh, either positively or negatively. So you're in a, an, a place to influence. It gives me quite, um, it makes me content to know that I'm at a place whereby I can impact people. So it's up to me to choose, you know, uh, what, what route I'll take. So yeah, basically that's for me uh, in a nutshell, I'll say that um, that has been my, my driving force. That has been my motivation. Um, being in sports and being a woman in sport is a rare thing. And so for me to actually uh, be embraced into the sport and excel and play at the highest level is a drug for me. It drives me to want to achieve more and more and more. So for me, I'd like to urge um, or, you know, advise the youngsters out there who are looking at us and wondering how I can get there. Be determined, never lose focus. Forget about the noise because there will be a lot of noise on your way on your way up, uh, there are those who are probably jealous or there are those who really just don't believe that you can actually hack and get to that level and they will bring you down and, and you know, pull you down. So forget about the no noise, focus on, you know, the goal. Because at the end of the day, if you look at the goal, you'll not see the hardships or, or the, 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 um, the, the bumps on the road that you'll have to, you know, have to get over to get to where you're going. Um, stay to the course, stay to the plan, um, and continue being self-driven. Working hard for me has worked uh, really well because I'm basically a hard worker. Uh, even with this brand, when we were starting, which is basic, barely just, uh, I'll say, in terms of deliveries, I, I ride a motorbike. So that is how aggressive I am. I'm, I, I do deliveries as well as I'm working and, you know, I'm doing all these things. But if I there's a client that asked me, I was, it was on a Sunday, uh, I, you know, I just done church and I went back to, I was back at home and I was trying to, you know, just rest. But a client called me and told me, Sele, I need um, half a liter, 500 ml at Siokimao. I threw the blanket, took my bike and went and delivered. And that client to date is doing the highest numbers of orders. So basically do not be distracted even when it seems hard, even when it seems challenging, that is your, that is your chance to rise above it and uh, you know, just put a stamp. Because if you don't believe in yourself, no one else will believe in you. Um, you know, just focus, as I've said, focus on the goal and you know, it will all work out. If you have a chance to um, pursue other avenues, be it school, do not, do not despise it. Just with humble beginnings, you know, if it's a professional course, you can just take one step at a time. Uh, do not despise humble beginnings, work hard and um, explore all avenues. If it's doing a small business, any opportunity that presents itself to you, take it with both hands, do your best and live, uh, live to God the rest and always pray. Well, thank you so much, Sele. OJ, on the other hand, Mr. Outlook, what, yeah. what outlook can you share with um, everybody out there in terms of motivation, um, striking the balance between work, school and play? But I think I actually got the best uh, co guest in, in the show because I think we share most most of the of the values or maybe the understanding of uh, what uh, you're asking about. The thing about the, the one thing I, I, I tell people is um, I, I also fear failing and, and that really drives me to 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 push hard to get try and achieve what I wanted to achieve. That doesn't mean that if I don't take losses or I don't I don't get um, losses around, around, along the way but um it's just that i embrace the loss and uh, i just 
dust myself up and, and do it again. So the fear of failure doesn't really mean that I don't take losses or I don't fail in life. I do, but I just embrace it differently because I use that as a motivator or as an motivation to, to do it better or to just dust myself up and I go again. If you know me closely, you know that about me because um, I, I, I take keen interest or I, I, I put so much in, in whatever I'm doing such that when it doesn't go right, I get frustrated initially. So that's where, that's the point where I don't like failing comes, comes in. But then after a few hours or days or even weeks, I do it again. I embrace the, whatever loss I picked or whatever pain I, I, I got because I believe pain gives you a lot of understanding on, on what you want to do next or what you need to change in whatever you're doing in your life or in your business aspect or in your career. When you get some pain in it, you just change the understanding of how you want to do it the next time. So that's one of the, the things that I really urge guys to, to pick up. Just take the loss, work hard. If you take a, a, a loss, if you get a loss or have pain in, in, in your way, just embrace it and, um, and, and understand it better and do it differently. Just take the minor set, setbacks because they'll always be there in, in life, in whatever field you are in, in whatever aspect of, of, of life that you're, you're doing, you'll have my, a lot of setbacks, some major, some minor, but the minor ones, just uh, it's, it's just an indication of um, some major, major uh, comeback that you're going to, to, to have, maybe if you keep pushing or pursuing whatever you want. Because I remember growing up, I was really, I, I, I really got, I think there's no one who's got um, beat in our house more than myself. All my brothers and sisters, we had a very um, tough and I had a very disciplinarian uh, father. And I don't think anyone got a lot of beating as I was because I was very curious. Every single time I saw something, I wanted to, to find out like uh, what's about it um, or what can I, what, what's the whole thing around the same thing. So the curiosity really um, got me punished a lot, but growing up or later in life, I just, um, I just um, maybe thought to myself that uh, I was always looking for something that would give me understanding of what I wanted to do or, or wanted to achieve in life. So maybe I was curious because I wanted to find some understanding in, in whatever I wanted, I wanted to do in life. So um, that's the pick up points that I take in whatever field I am in. If it's rugby, if it's school, or if it's um, business, I just have the three pillars, which are usually hard work, um, persevere, patience, and perseverance. They just oscillate like the same things uh, usually just come full circle for me. Because if I put in the, the, the shift that I want to put in whatever I'm doing, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm patient enough to wait for the, the, the positive um, outcome, even if it's not positive initially or at the, the, the first instance, then I'll have to persevere that part of it. That part of the journey is what I'll have to persevere. Then do it again, pick myself up and try and do it again. Do it differently, do it the same way, or do it in a, uh, in a, in a, in a mixed matter of uh, taking lessons and keeping the good part and throwing away the bad parts. That, that whole process for me just um, revolves around the, the, those three the, those three pinnacles and uh, that's just the only thing I, I would like to share with the, the, the viewers. Well, thank you so much, uh, Jacob Oje. Thank you so much, Celestine Masinde, for first of all agreeing to be on this platform this evening and for sharing your insights. They are valuable. Everybody has appreciated them. There is a comment here from Dominic Abimana. He has been your coach, Oje, on the national team level. He says, God bless you, Sele and Oje. I'm so proud of the journeys and most of all the inspiration you show every day to your age mates and the younger ones coming through. And certainly, I'm sure you have blessed everybody who has seen this and will see this in, um, in later moments. And... Um, Thank you so much once again. It has been a great Friday evening, a great two hours and four minutes. Uh, we will catch you again next time. This session was Rugby, Books and Entrepreneurship. So from me here, I just want to thank everybody who's attended this uh, session, who's watched it as well. Um, let's catch you again next time and thank you for your time. Would you?
Thank you so much. Bye. Yes, sir. Uh, I na shukuru pia. You know I didn't think it would go this long and there's so much. Nimekunywa maji 5 liters hapa. Nimekunywa maji 5 liters. Hey. Sele. Aishi eh. Sele. Sele will you be able to get home? Eh, hey, niko na duty hapa. Oh, I was worried about the time as well. No, I saw you in an office setting, but thank you so much. Welcome. Uncle home? Eh? Siko office, imagine, niko job. 